I have a question, question raised by Andy. Yes, yes or no? Mr. Bolton, I have a hard time calling you Jack for some reason, but um, you're my financial hero in in your book, The Nub. You talk about how you're going to be a financial hero in your book, The Nub. You talked about the irresponsibility of board of directors uh, getting bonuses and, and paying the CEOs and managing the company right into bankruptcy. Why doesn't uh, Vanguard withhold uh, approving the board of directors and send a message out to the, to the company? Well, I, first of all, I can't speak for any of the case on that. My understanding is there are some cases where, where we have withheld votes for compensation for the members. Uh, how widespread that is, how right it is, you know, my guess is it's not very much so. Because I saw those great, we didn't look as good as I would have liked to look. We looked worse than our, most of our competitors. And uh, I found that a little embarrassing. And somebody may find a goal with a survey, I don't, I don't know. But that has to come. And, uh, but it's a very, that's a funny, this has always been a funny mix of a perfection of business. And if Vanguard has done anything, it shoved it as far as I was able to. Flawed, though that implementation may have been on my part, to get over to the professional side and out of the business side. You're always on the business side, but minimize it. And most of the things you are exactly the opposite, go over to the business side and then not care about the professional side. It's all bringing money. It's Building assets under management. It's making a lot of revenues. Most of these companies are publicly held. The big companies are kind of future plus, banks, insurance companies, and so on, foreign and domestic. And uh, they're in to make a return on their capital, not your capital. So, growth of governance either subtracts from that clause, they offend clients, for example, or they vote on an issue that half their shareholders don't like. And it's Democracy that we have here. You know, the difference between winning and losing a landslide is 55% in this day and age. Uh, so let's, let's be generous and say you can be on the other side of that and uh, uh, irritate 45% of your shareholders. You just don't want to do that. Better to keep a low profile. Don't stick your head out and get shot off. And the company is just over 10 So those aren't very satisfactory. I always thought that the you know, Vanguard. In, 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 in large measure, I think, uh, got the reward at the beginning, through the beginning years, of being outspoken and critical and raising it up. And uh, you know, I think a lot of people have denigrated that uh, because they thought I was raising hell because I like to raise hell. Oh, I do like to raise hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, when, when I was asked to comment on something, I was always commenting on what a certain act meant, a certain event meant in terms of the good or bad or neutral on shareholders. And so when the press called, that's what I said. And when they called everybody else in the industry, they were thinking it was a good or bad for our company. They were thinking the stock a lot of that. us more money or less money. So they always do get a negative answer out of you. Because those interests are like this, they just slam into each other. So I would I would hope sooner rather than later, Dan Garth will say, well, damn it, we're going to be, we're going to raise the flag. And we're going to put these proxy proposals in and say, no more of a And he uh, you, you, maybe you want to ask about that this evening. So I, 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 I don't know what they're uh, They know what I feel. And I shouldn't tell you, by the way, that uh, a lot of other have spoken. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a complaint from any significant member of management about that board of any directors about, you know, can't you stop saying things? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I've heard it said that um, I, you know, I, I disagree, publicly disagree with Daniel. I don't think that's ever been the case. You know, I say what I think, I don't know what the position is at all. Uh, I have this kind of cold man, I don't know. I don't know what the root cause of the late shows. He was always very well prepared. He always had his little, you know, the rest of us did, but he has a little teleprompter right there. You couldn't see it, but I could see it. And uh, this was in the middle of actually a corporate governance thing. And uh, I, I think we were talking about the chair of the board or something like that. And uh, you know, Lou was the man, he was well briefed on that in the papers. And he said, Jack, I understand you disagree with Van Gogh on that point. And I said, no. And he looked astonished. I mean, you should have seen a look on his face. And I paused him in and said, not that I disagree with I disagree with Vanguard. He said, Vanguard disagrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> and we got to three more questions for the panel to stop laughing. <laughs> Very distracting. So, but then I don't mean, I know what our market world is. I know that you can't give up on marketing. Uh, I believe deeply you have to minimize 
doing things for marketing reasons. If you can, you can them because they're part of our world. And so it's, you know, it's fragile, it's flawed. But, uh, you know, I ask clients who don't know uh, about you know, I think they're going to say you know, they're doing something. And there's also a thing that I find it difficult to deal with. I guess they're working behind the scenes. Well, I'm sure they're talking the truth. Uh, but if nothing happening, nothing's happening, maybe we should work in front of the scenes. I don't know. Jack, we have a question from a good friend of both of ours, Dr. Taylor, who's with us in spirit. So, dear Jack, would you please give us your thoughts about rebalancing our portfolios? Okay, well, I'll say uh, something I've thought about and I'll uh, work on. Uh, I, I don't have an unequivocal answer about rebalancing portfolios. Uh, I do know that the facts say that not rebalancing two things, the facts say two things. Not rebalancing the portfolio is a better strategy than rebalancing. Simply because stocks have a higher return in the bonds over the long, long run over your lifetime, and therefore, whenever you rebalance, you're getting out of a higher yielding asset into a lower yielding asset. Not complicated. Uh, and uh, so that's what the data says. It also says something else, point two, that's interesting, and that is when rebalancing, uh, when not rebalancing loses the balancing, and there will be errors when it does lose. Uh, the losses are quite small, maybe a percentage point a year, but not as dramatic. Uh, and uh, so, on the other hand, and so that, that says, don't bother. Uh, and uh, I guess I'd say for most investors, don't worry about that. Uh, if you feel like rebalancing, do it. It's not going to be devastating to you. It's intelligent to do. Uh, it just may not be the best long-term strategy. But on the other hand, it may be a bit of short-term strategy. Uh, you know, eight hundred times different than what you can do. And uh, so I'd say, you know, if you want to rebalance, just follow a couple of rules. Don't do it very often. I mean, you know, people rebalance every month. I just, I just don't think it's worthwhile. Uh, I think you should consume by whether you're in fifty-two percent of stocks or. 49 or 53 or 4, depending on what stocks you own, or index you own, or what bond you own, depending on what's a good decision or not. So, you know, maybe rebalance once a year. I would say only do it if it's significant. If you want to be at 50 50 and you get to the end of the year and you're 52 48, honestly, I don't think it's worth worrying about. On the other hand, for a period of time, you want to be at 50 50 and you get to 55 or 60. And you want to rebalance, you can rebalance on that basis. So I don't have any easy answer. Uh, I feel like investors feel better, and maybe we'll leave them as not, not investment problems, behavioral problems. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I don't do it. But on the other hand, I have rebalance for me in the last 15 years because bonds did about 6 or 7% a year. And stocks did probably 15 years or probably 1 or 2% or 3 or now. So all of a sudden, I'm 80 months, and I'm happy with that. Short and immediate duties, um, short and low bond market, short index and low bond index in my retirement plan, which is what you say is investment. And uh, so it's a kind of tweet and zone, I think. Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand, and then Jack will recognize you. I'll be right back. Hi, Jack. Thank you. Uh, one of the charts had Vanguard's uh, assets going from 550 billion to a million, a trillion four, and the employee ratio per dollar or something going up to 18 to 8. But the expense ratio grows by three days. Why is that? I have to look at that chart. I was surprised you all. I'm sure you're right. Well, I'm on the on the chart. I have to go to 59, 35, 27, 23. Yeah. Did it say 20 in the chart? 27. Yeah, 27. I have 27.
you know, well, you, you, you're right, it's the more important call, and I feel a free rider kind of thing. Yeah. You make the company better, and you know, 2% of the stock is right all the day, or almost everything. And they, you know, risk the other 98% when you're doing it. Uh, the, there, there's no easy answer to that. And, you know, I don't think, I can say two things. One, the cost of some kind of research effort should not be off. Uh, you know, you don't have pour over every single company we own. Probably 4,300 companies in our various portfolios. And you don't have to do that. Or maybe you can pick your targets. Maybe larger companies where you can see things going on longer. So one thing is, it shouldn't be that expensive. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned 150 million is a third of the basis point. My God, for $50 million, we would have the second biggest research department in the entire mutual fund in $50 million. Second biggest, well, no, second biggest. One of the biggest research departments. Uh, and uh, for 140 million, it would be that's one basis point. It would be you know, it would be near that much. So we have the resources to do it. But even more importantly, uh, I'm trying to organize. This is a funny story. Uh, I tried to organize when I had this uh, uh, foundation for long-term investors, uh, coalition of long-term investors. I can't remember what I call it. At the post Enron, maybe the post Enron. Uh, tried to. Try to get together a group of the index fund, other long term managers, including Bill Miller, and Chris Davis, and the Davis funds, uh, to get together and do something together. We jointly fund an effort to do the research on corporations, and then we go our own way, okay? So uh, that was uh, uh, an attempt to fail, but what made it kind of amusing is, in the meeting came to its conclusion, Chris Davis is lost in New York. Uh, the uh, second in command of one of the large index firms, which will remain nameless, but telling two of us, I don't know where you went, said, You know, Jack, I understand what you're trying to do, but why don't we leave it to Adam Smith's invisible hand? <laughs> and I said, For God's sake, don't you know that we are Adam Smith's invisible hand? Think <laughs> about that. So, uh, you know, those, those are issues that are, I don't think, I don't think it's a cost issue as to as, as, as why we don't expect them. Uh, I think it's more inertia and more, more than more that sees it not in my market or not in my things, uh, rather than expensive. And uh, if you get a little long-term investors like capital group, they're already analyzing all these companies. We are not. So that's the best I can do. I think. Uh, it'll come. It is going to come. I guarantee it. Yes, sir. Another way of hiding it all. 
but it's vicious and it's nasty and it's self-serving and uh, you, know, you can't get any more on it. And uh, I don't like the way that Congress runs and avoiding into some like, immediate crisis like this. Roger Clements on dope or whatever it's called. <laughs> and my God, they're all jumping out in the air and speaking out there against dope. Well, isn't that great? <laughs> It's uh, 
uh, behavior on that because if your stock's going to add 57% and uh, you know, your income may not even be changed, uh, but you're going to panic and get out of stocks to do that. You're going to look at those two different compartments rather than one compartment. This is an interesting I haven't done much work on it. I've got about 11 to do work on for all of this, but why is it we think of in terms of compartments? Um, you know, think of that for, for, for example. There's going to be a balance fund that's 50 50 in stocks and bonds. And so we have that fund and it goes kind of like this. And then we go, also, kind of alternatively, 50% of the bond index fund, 50% of the stock index fund, two separate funds, where the performance is just the same. But you know, when the stocks go down, you panic. And when they go up, you're mad the manager is because you didn't get all of it here in the balance fund, you got all of it here in the stock account. So we have, we have to fix these. Uh, Rate, uh, these, uh, but I, I, don't, you know, I don't think people are going to actually do that. I'm not sure I recommend doing it because we have not only the arithmetic, but I mean that one. I wouldn't say Social Security has a zero property for that question. Uh, you know, in effect, the way the question reads, I'm saying you should, you should value security, Social Security at 100% of what you think it's worth, uh, say $300,000. Maybe you should say, well, count Social Security is half of my fixed income now. So you rebalance over three quarters of the total, and that 50 50 on that, I think 65 or 70 percent of stock. But there aren't easy answers, particularly when you get the behavior. But the math is clear, uh, and that is if you want 50 50 Social Security or a good corporate pension, uh, it's very much the same thing. Although somebody's going to say, can you name a good corporate pension? Now they're deeply endangered across the world pretty much. And then they go into the government and you get half the income you expect as a our whole benefit system, our pension system, and that's uh, and so I say think about that as a kind of a rule of thumb and not something that quote great unquote global says, do this or that, nobody should do that under any circumstances. And I don't think we're new all but really. But do you think the you had mentioned several times about the dividends and the reduction of dividends, uh, couldn't that be attributed to the lower capital gains tax rate situation? Do you think that's the primary value for the lower dividend distribution? It shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be for maybe an obvious reason. And that is most of the dividends will never get taxed. Think about that. 70% of all the money is managed by institutions. Up and downs aren't taxed, state and local government pensions aren't taxed, corporate pensions aren't taxed, and hence the mutual companies, the assets aren't 401ks, or IRAs are not taxed. So don't let that little bit that remains you know, overwhelm your common sense. And, you know, to me, it's all an exercise. I mean, I think the Lord, I will confess to me, with the soul, I'm not right. I think the Lord did give me a healthy amount of common sense. And he didn't give me a brain, and he didn't give me a sophisticated brain. But the more I think about it, the more I'm just happy to have a little common sense and kind of look through conventional wisdom and say, why should that be? And what more do I need to know? And what's going on out there? Not only is what's said, but what's going on out there that isn't spoken or written about? Uh, what do you leave out of speech? Why do you do that? Uh, and uh, so it, 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 it shouldn't be a big deterrent. And uh, then you should also realize that the remainder of the usual time in the street, not the world, not the tax burden, half or the half, the other half. These funds are run, first they're not running your money for the tax burden investors, this is a crazy thing, and they're not running your money for tax burden investors, they're not tax burden investors. And that's why I thought it would be a good idea to have tax managed funds, and we did in 1993, I think. And because uh, it's the way to run money. You, you go to a trust officer somewhere, and he's going to want to know all about your tax status. It gets into the municipal bonds, it gets into the gross cost of assisting income stocks. And uh, so it, it shouldn't be a big deterrent given the amount that's never taxed under any circumstances. And the fund managers run the remainder of the portfolio. Uh, they don't care about taxes. They get paid on pre tax returns, not after tax returns that you get. Uh, and, uh, so they're running those portfolios as if there's no difference. And then there's this, uh, as those 
Chinese are basically doing the limit. They own, I don't know, so 2 trillion more debt. That's around 12 trillion. I think China owns some round numbers, 2 trillion, I'm not sure. But it's a, it's a big number, certainly in the trading range. And uh, the value of those bonds are going to go down in interest rates so well. So they're, they're riding a you know, difficult tiger, too. So, you know, I wish I had the answers. I don't think even the great economists really have the answers. Uh, and, um, you know, the markets are very unpredictable. The actions of the nations are unpredictable. I wasn't surprised that uh, the uh, euro crisis didn't get even worse. And I think it might get worse again. And Britain is not all that much better shape than Greece. Somewhat, but not a lot, or Spain. What are they calling the pigs? Portugal, Italy, Ireland, of course, Ireland, Greece, Greece and Spain. Aren't we great in acronyms? <laughs> is this a great country or what? <laughs> so I, I, I really don't know. I, I think you try and protect yourself. I mean, is the answer to find a table? What would you do? And uh, I guess you go short. Not, not short selling, but short maturity. I don't believe in short selling. It might be a good idea, but I just think we're I think definitely no losses. And uh, it doesn't seem to me, it's a timing strategy. And timing is, you know, it's just, you know, you do it. So, uh, you know, you go short, if you're worried about that kind of thing. You go into gold, um, you probably go into commodities, uh, and uh, I wish you well. <laughs> but I wouldn't do it. I have to mine some gold, uh, you know, just to be able to protection, but I haven't done it, and I probably won't do it. I'm too busy with other things. Okay. Next question. When you lie down at night and you think about the day, do you ever spend time thinking about all the millions of people that you have value, you've provided value to in terms of setting up Vanguard for the benefit of the investment. Do you ever think about that? And if so, how does it make you feel? <laughs> well, first of all, there's a answer. And that is that the last thing I think about before I go to bed is whether I finish the New York Times for all sorts of Things there, they're not 
And that's a good question. The question is what I talk about that question and performance. And then morning star also that problem. We're all using the expense ratio, simple and short. And it wouldn't include any expense ratio. If you're buying shelf space for somebody, you're paying for it out of your management fee. And therefore that is an expense ratio. And any management company spends is in the expense ratio. All your point services are in the expense ratio. What is not in the expense ratio are basically uh, Two things, uh, two additional costs, and actually we should be talking about three additional costs. One is per million transaction costs. And since we don't know exactly what they are, and this industry doesn't want to guess what precisely they are, but uh, I, you know, I use a rule of thumb about, uh, about 1% of your turnover. So turnover costs you, your 100% turnover costs you about 1% a year. So through the rule of thumb, maybe more like 3 quarters of 1%. If you turn over 50%, be like 35 days, almost 50 days, or something like that. We don't know that, but I would use it because I'd rather be you know, generally, uh, generally right rather than precisely wrong. And uh, so that's, that's, that's a big cost that that's totally unknown. And the other is sales charges. If they're in 12B, 1B, that will be in the, in the expense ratio. But if they're not, they just run in sales charges. And they're outside of that, then that would not be done. And then, of course, taxes are never covered. And that's a huge thing. I mean, we would be fine. Everybody had to pay taxes. But you're going to run your money tax efficiently. One of the single most important things you do is pay for it. But there was all the same thing. Capture as much of the market return and keep it as you possibly can. So that's why I use a number of like 2 to 2.5% of the all in cost. That when, in fact, the average equity fund um, the, uh, the, uh, the average unweighted average money expense ratio is about 1.4, but in fairness, we'll be in the whole is about 1% uh, for weighted by fund assets. But on the other hand, that comes Vanguard, uh, we're getting pretty big enough for 15% over 6 in the mutual fund industry. So, you know, all these averages, you've got to play a little bit of an improved point. The ICI is probably willing to do that. Uh, but um, the I use the number of that one and a half percent and two percent. It's easy to get there rather than the typical one percent you might use for that. I'll take one more question on this one. It's an honor to ask you a question. I'm a new bulk of that I'm very much impressed. You had talked about corporate governance in the United States and essentially incurred that it was a bit of a mess. With one one goes overseas to invest, it's probably somewhat worse than maybe the transparency in some developing nations is lousy. Um, having said all that, what do you see the role of institutions in the United States being, I've never raised the vanguard, in helping reduce the risk of those kinds of information failures in your in their investment? And are you talking about that abroad or here in the US? Abroad. Abroad. I mean, we had in there the very groups, and I'm a member of one, I'm not a very active member, which is trying to do a lot in improving gardens abroad. As far as I know, no U.S. mutual fund group participates in that at all. Uh, it just, uh, we're so short-term folks that you have to understand that governance matters nothing, zero, in the daily fluctuations, or monthly fluctuations, or even yearly fluctuations, or not. It just doesn't count. But it's everything in the long run that matters in the market, because the idea of governance is to me a very simple one. Is this corporation being run, big corporation, industrial corporation, or national corporation, is it being run in the interest of shareholders? That's what governance is about. So we should be saying, we Vanguard, we the mutual fund industry, and we the institutional investment management industry should be saying, we want to be damn sure that we come first before executive pay, uh, before stacking the board with our friends, uh, before getting into mergers, that make our company bigger and get paid more than they pay on. 62% of those mergers do fail. Um, we should be thinking more about what is the right amount of dividends to be given. I've often said, this is on the governance issue generally, uh, I don't see why we don't have higher dividends paid to, to, to uh, <coughs> institutional investors who held the stock for over three years. So the dividend is $2. Give them $2.25. $2.20. $2.50. Once you get to that whole period, 
And uh, he did an end to matter a lot of institutionalization. Not as much as they should in the Lenin industry, because we consume so much of them, we don't want to talk about dividends. And the ICI has never, as I said in that Wall Street Journal, never even hinted on the idea that such a thing as a dividends as a percentage of the income, expenses as a percentage of dividend income. And uh, I didn't get any nice letters from him. <laughs> I didn't get any, any nice letters from Mr. Hennessy either. <laughs> well, now I mean, I hate that kind of street fighting stuff. The only letter I really loved was the one written by my son. I probably all saw that. So I was like, um, and I, I should tell you this, uh, sort of anecdotally, uh, I didn't know I was going to write the letter, but I, I talked to him after the op I talked to him every week for about an hour, which was on Friday morning. And, uh, Said, when you, he said, I love your op-ed, and, and actually I agree with 75% of it. <laughs> and I said, this is what you don't stand in line with I said, you know, that's great, if you agree with more than 75%, I would have felt I hadn't done my job. <laughs> so, uh, but the Hennessy thing, he said he wasn't talking about his company, he was talking about the industry. You better believe he wasn't talking about his company. And that big fund got huge, had a hot performance record, and then four years since, five years since, it's in the 100% percentile. Wow, well, the first performing fund in the entire category, I guess, the value fund. And uh, you know, it's very hard uh, to be in the fourth quartile five years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. You know, I mean, if you try to be there, I guarantee you, you could not get there. Uh, and what would you do? Uh, and and someone, someone said, uh, I think it was Michael Ramsaw, um, works down with Bill Miller, good, good guy, very analytical. Uh, said the difference he had a piece on skill versus luck. And he said one of the differences is uh, if you decide you want to fail, uh, if it's all luck, you can't do it. Uh, right? And if it's all skill, it's pretty easy to fail. You know, that heart surgeon that put my new pump in, if you want to fail, I can't tell you how easy it would have been. <laughs> <laughs> Want to fail in the investment business. It's just as difficult, really, when you think about it. It's just as difficult to fail as to succeed. Except you make failure easier because of all your costs. And then that turns out to be the differentiator. So no, there's not much skill. And there's some. And uh, skill and luck, um, you, can't, you can't have a good front record without skill and luck. The luck seems to dominate. When you think about Bill Miller, everybody's here on a good, good money manager. But he was at the bottom of the day, he was the peak market for five and seven years in a row. And then was in the 100 percent of trade. Uh, just, uh, just after all the money came in. I mean, it's a vicious business, it's a hard business. And I respect money managers who are trying to do a good, honest job because it is such a hard business. And uh, you know, I, I know that, and, and I respect them for trying. But uh, they're going to do that by investing in them. Okay, we're going to hear maybe go to, to uh, launch, but before we do, we're going to attack that. We talk.
interested in that you, for those of you who can remember, I think uh, about seven years ago, uh, I got a view of the photos with a nice original mount on it. Yeah, and how many years ago that? That was in 2002. Yeah, well, that, that hangs uh, right above it. Painting with the American flag, uh, though I have, or at least a photograph, a very nice one, uh, has the Constitution written with the rights 